this is what we think is a new bacterium, so that just in and of itself is interesting because uh, tick-borne diseases are emerging diseases and this seems to be another organism that is probably transmitted by ticks to humans. Another significant point is that it causes a disease called ehrlichiosis, which was not thought to be in Minnesota and Wisconsin prior to this report. So that's new. Not only is it a new organism, it's a new disease relatively to people that live in these two states. Uh, the third important thing really about it is that uh, physicians, because it is new, probably are not familiar with this. They may not know how to test for it, and the tests that are recommended for this are probably not widely available at this time. And up to this point, we have perhaps heard of ehrlichiosis, mm -hmm. but it was a completely different strain and a completely different specific test. Exactly. There are two species of Ehrlichia in the United States that we had known about prior to this, Ehrlichia chaffeensis and Ehrlichia uwingii, and they were not found in the upper Midwest. They were found in the south and uh, going up into the lower Midwest, not thought to enter Minnesota and Wisconsin. What is it about Ehrlichiosis that's concerning? Well, Ehrlichiosis in general typically is a a uh, mild, relatively mild to moderate infection, although it can make a normal healthy person feel quite ill. Headache, severe fever, uh, or high fever, severe body aches, chills, muscle aches, those are common symptoms of ehrlichiosis. But in patients that are immunocompromised or elderly or the very young, they're at more increased risk for severe disease. And in, that, in those cases, you can get organ involvement so it can involve the lungs, the gastrointestinal tract, uh, the brain, and in rare cases there have been fatalities reported. Now that's ehrlichiosis in general. To date with this new organism, we haven't seen any of the more severe complications, although our four patients definitely had fever, body aches, chills, headache, and one of them was hospitalized for a couple of days because of his illness. Do we have some suspicion of how commonly this occurs? That's a good question. I think we really don't at this point because we don't have the tests out there in the community to detect this. It's probably most people that uh, would be at risk for this are not getting tested. And so because of this discovery, we would imagine <coughs> that the testing would increase or at least the tests would become more widely available. Yes, I think so. There'll be a general interest in these tests. Not all labs will be able to bring them up because they're a molecular test, they're a more sophisticated test, they require greater laboratory facilities, but we do know that the state health departments will have tests for these organisms, as will the CDC, and then the reference labs like Mayo Clinic will have a test. Very good. Mm -hmm. Which kind of tick is the one that is involved with passing along this condition? Well, we've found it in multiple ticks and they have all been Ixodes scapularis ticks, which is also called the deer tick or the black-legged tick. And that's the same tick that also transmits Lyme disease, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis. And those diseases all can be relatively serious. They can be. And uh, you can possibly get multiple infections if you are bitten by a single tick that happens to carry all of those organisms or some of those organisms in it. It sounds like there's a difference in the time mm -hmm. element also as far as being able to transmit any one of these diseases from that same tick. Is that right? Well, we do know the tick has to be attached for a certain period of time, 24 to 48 hours, to transmit Lyme disease, and probably ehrlichiosis and babesiosis as well. So finding a tick on you, or finding a tick that has bitten you, if it's a relatively short period of time, that's not necessarily a cause for concern for these organisms. But finding a tick that's been there for 48 hours and is fully engorged, that would be a potential concern and physician, patients should bring that to their physician's attention because a physician may decide to prophylax them for Lyme disease. Very good. Now I did see one headline news report that characterized this new strain of ehrlichiosis as being potentially instantly transmitted 
at the time of the bite, and that's not true, it sounds like. I don't think we have information to uh, support that right now. And actually, we think this is transmitted by a tick, but we haven't actually done the experiments where ticks have been attached to humans and you've seen it transmitted. We just know that other causes of ehrlichiosis are tick transmitted, and we found it in ticks, and we found it in humans. So I think that this, it is best to say this is a probable tick-borne illness at this point. In our brief conversation, it mm -hmm. sounds like some of the um, Lyme disease interested groups have already contacted you and wonder if there might be an exacerbating situation that mm -hmm. occurs because of this new strain of ehrlichiosis and Lyme. And yes, that's a very good point. Uh, we don't have any evidence that would show that this would interact with Lyme disease and cause a more severe symptomatology. However, ehrlichiosis has its own signs and symptoms, uh, as does Lyme. And so someone that may think they have Lyme disease may actually have ehrlichiosis and or babesiosis, for example, another tick-borne disease, and they may get treated for one and not the other and not recover. And so sometimes I think people may think that they have chronic Lyme disease, but they actually have a, a different tick-borne disease. If you were speaking to uh, a general practice physician, mm -hmm. I guess, is there advice that you can give to the doctors when it comes to treating someone who has a suspicious uh, tick? Yes, definitely. There are guidelines that have been put forth by the IDSA, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, and uh, those should be followed as far as prophylaxis or treatment for patients that have potential tick-borne disease. So for that physician, I would say looking at those guidelines, following those, and considering this organism as well as other potential tick-borne diseases. If a patient tests positive for, say, Lyme disease, well, it's probably prudent to consider that the patient may have also been co-infected with other tick-borne diseases like ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis, or babesiosis. So, Testing for multiple diseases is often a good idea in these patients. And as far as talking to the patients, is mm -hmm. advice that would be helpful to them? Well, I think that patients should be self-advocates, and if they have found a tick that has been attached and it's engorged, and they think it's been attached for greater than 24 hours, they should bring it to their physician's attention. If they're in a Lyme endemic area, the physician may decide to give an antibiotic to prophylax for Lyme disease, though those are IDSA recommendations uh, if there's no contraindication to the patient receiving an antibiotic. <clears throat> um, okay, and the antibiotic yeah. is fairly simple mm. to administer, I understand. It's doxycycline, which is, uh, it is the preferred treatment and prophylaxis for Lyme disease as well as ehrlichiosis. Okay, very good. Right. Um, growing up mm -hmm. in a farming community, I remember my grandfather removing wood ticks, mm. dog ticks, with the hot end of a match. And right. I know that's just the absolute I would wrong thing not, to do now. I would not recommend that. So the way you want to remove a tick is actually with tweezers. The idea is to keep the mouth parts intact because if it's through the mouth parts and the saliva that the tick is transmitting these diseases. So say you had a tick on your arm or your hand, you'd want to get the tweezers right down close to the mouth parts of the tick and then pinch it and pull out in a single continuous movement. You wouldn't want to twist it because that could leave the mouth parts in the skin and you could get a super infection, a bacterial infection, or you might still have transmission um, and you don't want to burn it. You really just want to pull the tick out intact. Uh, anyone who's going outside in areas where there could be ticks, which in Minnesota and Wisconsin, there are plenty of those areas, will want to, first of all, wear an insect repellent like DEET or permethrin, and you can buy permethrin impregnated clothing. Also, try to stay on paths when you're outside. If you're going out into tall grasses and brush, that's where ticks tend to be. So then in those situations, you'd want to wear long pants, probably tuck them into your your socks or wear boots, and then also wear long sleeve clothing, long sleeve shirts. Okay, um, getting a little bit further into the science of this, mm -hmm. how is it that you determine the difference in this new bacterium? Well, we first 
identified it at a Mayo Health System site in Eau Claire in Wisconsin. The techs there are very good and they noticed that our molecular test that detects Ehrlichia chaffeeensis and Ehrlichia uingii also showed a result that was somewhere in between those two organisms. And we diagnose these by looking at peaks. We know that we expect to find a peak for Ehrlichia chaffeeensis here, a peak for Ehrlichia uingii here, but instead we saw a peak right in the middle. And so that made them think, rightfully so, that this was probably an Ehrlichia, but it didn't fit into one of the two known causes of Ehrlichiosis. So it was reproducible. They tested it again, were able to reproduce the results. That's when they brought it to my attention and we did some additional testing. We actually looked at the genetic structure of two of the genes, the genetic makeup in the Ehrlichia organism, found that they were different than the known Ehrlichiosis causes, and then we contacted the CDC. So from there, the investigation ensued. What probably one of the good things that will come out of this is physicians will be aware that there is ehrlichiosis in Minnesota and Wisconsin, not just anaplasmosis. And so testing for ehrlichiosis as well as anaplasmosis should be considered for certain patients. And <clears throat> this should increase awareness amongst physicians regarding that. This was a real collaborative effort involving multiple local and state health authorities, as well as the CDC, the University of Minnesota, the University of Wisconsin. There were multiple individuals that made this happen. Uh, so first of all, the techs that were very astute and picked this up in Eau Claire, and then bringing it to our attention, but then the CDC got involved. They sent officers from the CDC to do an investigation, interview the four patients that had been afflicted, the four patients that we reported, and then the state and, health, state, uh, and local health agencies got involved. The University of uh, Minnesota was able to grow this organism in culture, and then the University of Wisconsin helped us collect the ticks for testing. So lots of people, really great, exciting collaboration. It really was a fascinating bit of detective work mm -hmm. to unravel what the extra blips you know, it really were was in the lab. The folks from the CDC actually went to the patients' homes and got pictures of their homes, found that they were all near wooded areas or the patients had visited wooden, wooded areas in the days preceding the tick bite. Mm -hmm. So they were able to find out that all four patients had probable exposure to ticks. So that sort of investigative work really requires a hands-on, on-the-ground approach. And uh, so that's what we were really able to carry out with this type of collaboration. Right now, all of the cases that we've detected have been from Minnesota and Wisconsin, and we've tested thousands of patients from around the United States, but we've only detected it in patients from Minnesota and Wisconsin, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Also, we've tested ticks from around the United States, and again, only positive in Minnesota and Wisconsin. There was also a patient from North Dakota who had been camping in Minnesota who was positive. So it does seem to be fairly localized at this point, but having said that, there's no reason why this couldn't extend past the two states, and it could be that we just don't have the testing mechanism to detect this new organism. It may be in other states and other labs haven't been testing for it. So I think the exciting thing about this is by bringing it to physicians' attention and laboratories' attention, they can help develop, they can develop the tools to detect this. So maybe we will see it popping up in other places. There's no reason why it couldn't pop up in New England, for example, and the East Coast where other tick-borne diseases are very prevalent. So you really helped to put this on the radar screen now. Well, I think that this report really did. We've also started testing rodents because we think that, like Lyme disease and babesiosis and anaplasmosis, that there is probably a small rodent reservoir that the life cycle involves. And we have found it in two mice, one mouse from Minnesota and one mouse from Wisconsin. We also tested the blood of deer collected at Camp Ripley in Minnesota. We tested 200 specimens. We did not detect it, detect it in deer yet. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't. I think we need to test more specimens, but it could be that the deer doesn't play a role in the life cycle. So there's lots of interesting areas to still explore.